Welcome um, everybody back here to uh, Siegel Talks in New York City at the Martini Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY. Um, the Siegel Center at the moment, as far as we know, is the only theater institution in New York or the US uh, creating daily new uh, programming. And uh, we don't put up uh, past performances or, or new things on video. We think it's a uh, time to think, but also a time to listen and to listen carefully and to use um, this crisis. We had Milo Rao in yesterday who said, uh, this is a tragic time in the sense of the tragic time. It's a real crisis. It's for thousands of years we went through this, um, but we have to uh, take it serious, learn from it and prepare. So we here have theater artists and thinkers. Uh, it is a time I think where we all have to listen to theater people and artists, as we say, the artists have been on the right side of history, on the right side of social progress, on the right side of also what is right. And uh, there is this old saying, if you don't know what's right or wrong, always do the right thing. The question is, what is it? What's the right thing to do? And with us, we have uh, the great Richard Schachner, a grandmaster of the, our field, a, a great, great thinker, philosopher of theater, but also a great practitioner whose work has changed the field, has uh, changed what we think about theater and performance. And uh, Richard uh, has been often to the Siegel Center as a good friend. And um, so uh, we ask him also to come on here on, on our talks to, to tell a bit about uh, how he experiences his days, what he's thinking about and uh, what's on his mind, which is a, of course a great, great mind. So uh, Richard, welcome. I'm very glad to be here. And I just want to say, I, I saw and tuned into Mila Rao yesterday. That was really extraordinary. So congratulations. The whole series is a fine idea. Well, thank you, Richard. That, that really means a lot. Maybe someday you can have it so the, uh, some of the viewers can phone in and we can do some uh, questions that come from uh, outside of uh, the room. That would be awesome. That's nice. true. That we, we should do. Maybe we should have them a bit longer, um, um, the talks. Yeah, though this was a, was a good talk yesterday, which you also can access on the archive of the Siegel Center YouTube channel, but also through the great HowlRound.com, our host here at Emerson College. Um, Richard, so where are you now and uh, how, how do you feel? Well, you know, where is one of those questions that's both physical and metaphysical and social. So physically, I'm at one Washington Square Village apartment, one U, which is my workspace, my studio. Around here, you see a lot of books. Uh, mm -hmm. Back there, let me see, uh, you see a mask. There are many masks. And this is where I write, I think. There's a, 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 a single bed there. Sometimes I take a nap. So that's where I am uh, physically. Uh, the, I'm not here all the time these days. I'm also at my uh, apartment which is on 10th Street, right near the Strand Bookshop, one block south of that, across from Grace Church. But metaphysically and socially, uh, you know, I'm in a really a liminal space, you know, an in-between space. I think uh, many of us uh, socially, philosophically, uh, spiritually are in this in-between space because what the uh, COVID-19 has done has kind of destabilized uh, destabilized uh, our, uh, our lives. Uh, it's complex and I'm sure you'll ask me some questions about it and I can elaborate. But uh, my friend David Letwin, who is a, an actor I've worked with a long time, that also a teacher of acting in, uh, in New Jersey at, at Rutgers University, he said that this, uh, what happened with the COVID-19 is it's like the, the roof has been blown off of the uh, reactor, like in Fukushima or, uh, and so we see the meltdown. We see the meltdown of our social systems. Obviously something quote natural quote, the, the disease has happened, but at least in the United States and perhaps elsewhere also, the consequences of the disease are social, political, aesthetic, and in, at certain levels, there's been a meltdown. In other words, there's been uh, reactions that are uh, uh, beyond scientific or different than scientific. Uh, lack of leadership in the United States, for example, and uh, 
uh, at the very top. Uh, uh, many, many conspiracy theories uh, uh, showing that uh, we have uh, a kind of far ranging imagination about what might cause this. And also uh, it gives play to the, to the, the to the fears. And uh, it also opens the possibility for true reconstruction, whether we'll, we'll take that opportunity or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, where I think in the, where, how would Brecht put it? We're not at the, we're past the beginning, but we're not yet anywhere near the end. We're approaching a series of middles or if my friend Victor Turner, who talked about social dramas, we've had the crisis, which has, uh, uh, we've had the breach rather, which is the introduction of this virus. And we've had the crisis, which is the dispersal of this virus globally. And now we're thinking of, uh, you know, redress of action. What are we going to do about it? And uh, the ending of this social drama phase, the fourth one is integration or schism. In other words, either we will find some new way, some different way uh, to go on with our social, political and uh, aesthetic arrangements, or we'll split. Uh, because one of the consequences that's happened, and e even this morning, uh, uh, Donald Trump has said he's going to stop immigration to the United States. It's kind of a hollow statement, since there isn't any immigration to the United States at this present moment. Uh, all flights, pretty much all flights have been canceled anyway, but it's an added kind of statement of uh, intense nationalism. And uh, that's one of the questions. Are we going to go forward after this with a, a kind of global set of cooperations deeper than we've had? Or are we going to go back to uh, the balkanization of the world in which uh, strong nations uh, remain in their own gated communities, weaker nations uh, are left out to uh, hang out to dry, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, uh, uh, although I'm a critic of many of the practices of globalization, I'm a supporter of the underlying idea of a single world, uh, of a diverse world, of free movement, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I do think that we're at the cusp now of whether that idea is going to go forward or whether it's going to be, I won't say stopped because I think the arc of history is very clear from smaller social organizations to larger ones, from uh, tribal groups to uh, communities, to uh, states, to nations, to United Nations and so on. The arc is clear, but it may be a 200 year dip in that. You know, The arc of history is also a very funny arc. It doesn't go like this, it goes like this. It's only when you get far enough back that it looks like a smooth, a smooth arc. So there are many, many uh, questions. So uh, I spend part of my day thinking about that, of course. I also, uh, I'm still editor of TDR. And for those of you out there who write to, and want to be published, I'd be very glad to, for you to send me your articles or your uh, uh, performance text, uh, tdr at nyu.edu. I mean, so I spent a lot of time reading uh, submissions and deciding on issues and working with the consortium editors, the editors from different institutions that collaborate with TDR, Yale and Brown and uh, Stanford and the Shanghai Theater Academy. Uh, so uh, I, do, I do that work. And then <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm smiling because I also do a lot of cooking. I like cooking. Uh -huh. And when I was <clears throat> a, a, a younger man, uh, in my 20s, I uh, actually worked professionally as a cook, not a fancy cook. I was not a chef. I was just a guy who turned lobsters and steaks and made eggs and short order cook, but I did it. And I learned how to make soups and this and that. And uh, I like cooking. Cooking and in theater New Jersey was times. so close. You know. It was in your New Jersey times? or No, no, this was in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Provincetown. I ran a theater out of my kitchen because I was working during the day as a cook and I was uh, running a theater, but there was always, you know, uh, in restaurants, there's always extra food. There's food that you can't serve the next day because it's no longer fresh. There's food that's never been touched from the table that people just don't eat. So uh, I was able to feed my theater uh, from the back door of uh, my kitchen because I was the second in charge of this, this place in Provincetown, which is a great artistic community. That was back in 
1963, uh, 62, uh, no, no, earlier than that, 57, 58, in the, in the late 1950s. Yeah, in a way, we all some way get back to kind of home cooking, like real we yes, just, we real thinking home we do it at home. And um, so, um, in a way, in your mind, you know, then want to say what's cooking, but is there something where you feel it has an impact that's different than other crises? You have seen so much. You have seen the civil rights movement, where you know where you were. I think in in Arkansas, well, even the famous march. You have seen the Vietnam War. You have seen. Of course, the Iraq crisis, the Kennedy assassination, you have a, a lifespan. How does this feel to you, this crisis? Well, we are you're now? making me sound like I'm Carl Reiner's 2000 year old man. <clears throat> I, yeah. I, I, I wasn't there for Henry VIII and I wasn't present at the crucifixion. Uh -huh. But yeah. uh, those other things, yes. Well, all of those other things that you're talking about, the uh, civil rights uh, movement, uh, the freedom movement, the uh, Vietnam War, etc., were human made, right? The, the instigation was, uh, was uh, done by, by, by people. And even if you're a biological determinist, we, we have the appearance of, of free will. The uh, uh, virus is not human made. I, I reject entirely the idea that it came out of a laboratory. But even if it did come out of a laboratory, it is itself not a human person. It doesn't have agency in that sense. It has biological agency. It has the determination of wanting to, if uh, actually wanting to is the wrong word, but it does spread. Uh, but it's not under human control. And that's one of the reasons why it takes on this mythic uh, uh, qualities. Now, Milo yesterday said it was a tragedy. Uh, I would more likely say it's somewhere uh, in, between a melodrama and a farce, because uh, in the great tragedies, you have noble leaders who are coping with uh, insurmountable uh, odds, whether it's somebody like Lear who makes terrible mistakes, uh, but still is a, a noble person, or if you have somebody like Hamlet who overthinks the situation but does really think it through, or somebody like Oedipus who's really an innocent, right? I mean, he himself does nothing wrong. Maybe you said he shouldn't have lost his temper when he meets Laius in the road, but aside from that, he what has he done wrong? He's tried to defend himself against this prophecy, so that's why he leaves Corinth. Uh, he leads uh, 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 Thebes well, one supposes, and then the plague comes and he wants to take care of it. So he is the, in a certain sense, the toy of destiny. And, and in, a, in a way, his powerlessness is what uh, uh, attracts us to him. He is a great king, he's a noble figure, but the circumstances just overwhelm him. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that's the situation we're in. I don't think Donald Trump is either Lear or Hamlet or uh, Oedipus. Uh, Donald Trump is not somebody who uh, makes uh, noble mistakes. Uh, he's not somebody who overthinks things if he thinks at all. And uh, he's certainly not somebody who has the, uh, the, the well-being of all of the people who are afflicted by the plague in, in his heart. And there are many other world leaders also, several other world leaders, you know, in Poland, in Brazil, in Hungary, uh, uh, who, is, uh, who are uh, not uh, Oedipuses. So uh, what we're seeing here is, uh, if we want to use a, a dramatic metaphor, is not so much a tragedy as, as a melodrama, which is also full of, uh, of, of violence and bad outcomes, uh, although melodramas usually resolve themselves in a happy way, more or less. And it's also farcical in the deep sense of farce, in the Charlie Chaplin sense of farce, uh, in, the, in the deep Shakespearean sense of farce, you know, Falstaffian farce, where the farce has consequences, or Moliere's farce, where, 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 where we laugh at some of the inanities that are put forward, but still the outcome is very bad. Uh, mm. The uh, the other thing, you know, there's so much to say about this uh, situation. I can speak mostly about the what I know about the American situation. I really can't speak to what's happening in the UK or Poland or, you know, I, I will speak a little bit about the global south in a moment. But about the American situation, as we know, um, uh, disease has a, I, I was saying that it, it's natural and not human made, but the reactions are human made. And the reaction to it is uh, uh, 
it continues and exposes how the American society as it's currently constituted crushes the poor, crushes people of color much more. I mean, I am uh, acknowledged, I am a, a, a man of privilege. I, I don't consider myself white when I answer the, the uh, census question because I'm Jewish. And I think Jews have an also a, 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 long, a long history and uh, 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 often enough uh, European so-called, I, I, I reject the notion of race anyway, but if I have to accept it, I don't place myself as a member of the white race. Uh, that does not mean that I don't see myself in my current situation as highly privileged. I'm absolutely highly privileged. I live in a nice place. I have a nice place to work. I can put on my, over there, I have my mask when I go out. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, in, in an old person's home. I'm not in a prison. I'm not in a, uh, a, a crowded neighborhood like Central Queens. I'm not working in the hospitals. Uh, and in all of these places, it is the ordinary person of the, and the poor person who's taking the brunt of this. Uh, and that is not by accident. That is when I said, when Letwin said the top has been blown off of the reactor, we can see the meltdown. That is because American society is constituted and has increasingly been constituted on profound inequality, systematic, systemic inequality that is baked into the system. The last time we had a real move against it, well, two last times, the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s, and then what uh, Lyndon Johnson kicked off uh, in reaction to the civil rights movement, the freedom movement, and the changes in the 60s. But that's already 40 or 50 years ago. And since that time, from the presidency of Nixon on forward to the catastrophic presidency of Ronald Reagan, who laid the groundwork to this, the inept presidency of Gerald Ford, the stupid presidency of Bush II, and the downright evil presidency of Donald Trump. These uh, uh, systemic in inequities are more and more being acted out. And, and uh, uh, you know, Trump's motto for it is make America great again or keep America great, which uh, means keep it this, uh, uh, these inequities in place. So the virus shows it, it exposes it. Now, you're asking me, or maybe you'll ask me, uh, what's the remedy for this? We'll get to that. We've got uh, almost an hour. There are a few more things I want to say about it in uh, general terms. And then I'll stop and see what specific things you want to know. Uh, this, uh, uh, having said all that, this virus is not the big thing. This virus is really the little wave. The big one is the climate change. It's behind this virus. So this is like one of those early tremors that seems to be big on the scale, but it's not. Uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, but slowly, the large uh, 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 disruption will come. When New York will not have 250,000 cases and 15,000 deaths, but be under 10 feet of water. Where Amsterdam and London will have disappeared. Where uh, Bangladesh will be flooded out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know that scenario. So now we're getting a kind of uh, pretaste uh, in fast motion of what's coming at us in slow motion. And the astonishing thing is this pretaste in, in fast motion has generated a response of $2 trillion from the American Congress, daily press briefings by the president, all this attention. Nobody is paying attention to climate change. When the virus goes away and people go back to normal, they'll still say, oh, it's not happening. Oh, forget about it. While the amount of disruption that we're suffering now, the amount of death, the amount of misery, uh, the waves of people who will come from the global south uh, because of food disruption, climate and, and drought, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, is incalculably greater than we're having now and, and just as inevitable. So if you wanna talk about tragedy, if you want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the oracle, the oracle has said to us, this is coming. And here is a little taste. And you can mobilize for this preview, as it were. You can mobilize for this instant shock. Why can't you mobilize for the great thing that's coming? And what is it? What do I mean by mobilize? First of all, of course, to uh, 
forget about oil, <laughs> get as quickly as we can off of that. One of the uh, good things, and maybe if there is a God, this God, she is telling us, look how clean the air is in Delhi now. Look how clean the air is in New York, you know? So why can't we only have mass transit and electric vehicles? Why can't, you know, take climate change seriously and stop polluting the atmosphere. Take ch climate change seriously and uh, make preparations for the times that we're going to have to move millions of people, uh, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. So there is, there is a, a warning. So if we're in a social drama, there are two social dramas, the, the mini social drama of the uh, COVID-19 uh, 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 epidemic, pandemic, and the larger uh, uh, drama that is unfolding in slower motion, but with uh, uh, just as much, even more uh, horrific consequences down the road. Yeah, <clears throat> that's quite an uh, quite an assessment. I'm coming from you, and uh, a very very serious. I, 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 I want to say and, one more uh, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so if I, I said that the uh, the virus in the United States has uh, is aimed at the poorer people, uh, it's working itself out in that way, who do not have uh, the option of spacing out for six feet you know, in, in tiny little apartments who have to go to work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing is that there are, uh, there are huge epidemics, not pandemics, operating in the world today, cholera and malaria being two of them, who are killing several million people a, a year, you know, many more than the COVID-19. But because these uh, 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 epidemics are in the global south, in poor people, uh, we have gotten used to them. We say, oh yes, malaria. So, you know, oh yes, cholera and diarrhea, you know, simple, uh, simple diarrhea kill all these children. So we, we have kind of accommodated the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, death by disease that takes out people in the global south, that takes out people who don't have uh, proper plumbing, that takes out people in the mosquito area. And when it happens, in the industrialized uh, north, uh, and it starts in China, but we think of China, South Korea, Singapore, Italy, you know, the places where this is raging at the present moment, uh, then we pay more attention to it. So that also shows how we're structured. We don't really give a damn, finally, in the same way about malaria. I don't see, uh, or about dysentery, or about simple diarrhea. Uh, uh, at the same time, the COVID will come to India and uh, the, the and and Africa and Latin America. It's it's starting there. So the consequences there we're yet to see. The question will be when we plateau in the north, in Europe and uh, North America, and start to go down. Will we pay the same attention to what will happen in Latin America and Africa as we're paying attention now? I would hope we would, but I am not hopeful that we will. So your prediction is that, as someone said about history, you know, it's important to study history because you learn that people forget about history. So do, <laughs> do you, so you think um, well, there Mark will... said, you know, the first time it's history, second time it's tragedy, third time it's farce. Yeah, so you think it, uh, interpretation, it's a farcical time. Milo said it's a tragic time. I'm, I'm not sure if he hinting to the consequences that he said it's a tragedy, but you are right. And, uh, and so do you think uh, from your life experience, this rapture, what we experience, which is real, I think, as you said, things have already changed. Often, you know, revolutions, you know, come, but things already have happened before that the revolutionary moment uh, it comes. But do you think it will be for the better, or what is your what is your what is your evaluation? Will well, again, I have a, a short view and a long view. Yeah. Uh, uh, the long view is that everything is for the better, <laughs> even if the mm -hmm. human being species disappears from the planet. Somehow, we uh, I, the older you get, you know, in a strange way, uh, the last phase of life is a kind of. Uh, conflict between despair and wisdom. If you're not going to be mm -hmm. in despair about what happens, then you have to get wise about it. And the difference between despair and wisdom, despair says, ah, it's all gone to shit. Nothing is good. 
I'm tired of my life, I'm tired of you having your life. Wisdom says that the long view of history is that a life or whatever it is, or even non-life perseveres, the really long view perseveres. So these are little, little uh, uh, boop, boop, boop in that huge trajectory. You know, already uh, science tells us, and I uh, subscribe to it, that the universe has been in existence 16 or 17 billion years. Think of that, 16 or 17 billion years. Now, that may or may not be so, we don't know, we can't verify the Big Bang and all, but we know pretty well that the human species, modern Homo sapiens, have been in existence only 250,000 years. I mean, their earlier species, proto-humans, uh, a couple of million years ago, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the creatures Australopithecus, et cetera, et cetera. But modern humans, like you, Frank, like me, like the people uh, tuned into this, we've been around only a, a quarter of a million years. And I've been uh, thinking recently and writing about uh, the Paleolithic period, which is like 50,000 years to 10,000 years ago, long, long before there was Greece, long before there was Egypt, you know, 10,000 years ago is when it ends. But great artworks uh, having mm -hmm. occurred, we have the remnants of those artworks in the caves of Europe, but also the caves of Indonesia, rock walls in Australia. It's uh, very widely dispersed what people were doing 35,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. And they were making art and they were making performance because this art is not a gallery art. You don't, you can't go into the Cal, uh, you know, the, the uh, 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 Lascaux and Altamira and Chauvet, those places are not uh, art galleries. They are places where people made art as part of a performance complex. The behavior is evaporated, but the remnants are there. It's a kind of action painting and not Jackson Pollockian, although some of it is, and they're the handprints, there's the sense of action having gone on. So within the frame of that history, we're also going to be okay. But in the frame of the immediate history of the world since the Renaissance, in other words, the world since Europe expanded and colonized most of the rest of the world, the world now bouncing back, basically led by China, uh, which is uh, uh, now a, a hybrid uh, civilization. Because China was Marxist under Mao. It was his view of Marxism, but it certainly wasn't Confucianism as such. It was a hybrid. So China has uh, uh, emerged as a kind of uh, resurgence, and, uh, and, it, and it is, with its belt and road policy, going to be on the world scene, global scene, for the next few hundred years, at least. It has a kind of long view of history. The United States is kind of teetering now because unless we kind of adjust how we organize ourselves, the United States will become ideologically, if not economically and militarily, a second rate power. In other words, the United States' force, America's force, what attracted the immigrants was not the muscle that won the Civil War, was not the colonization of Teddy Roosevelt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was the idea of America, opportunity, liberty, those kind of things, that's what attracted people. That's what even attracted people a few years ago. That's what made people come. And now if that idea gets corrupted, it has already been corrupted. If we don't restore the notion of creativity, the notion of, a, of imaginary, uh, the, the liberty that the imagination can give, the idea of what America stands for, truly make America great again, then we're sunk in the short term of history. So uh, I think that this virus gives us the opportunity, just like I'm doing now, to think this through. We have, it seems to me, about 25 or 30 years between the end of this virus and, this, and the deep consequences of global warming. Within that time, we have to totally reconstruct or refigure the American contract, particularly, and through it, the Western con contract, and be in negotiation with China and their social contract. So how uh, and, and take into account the ambitions of uh, India and the global South. Uh, I mean, these are big, big questions that are going to be that are far beyond Richard Schechner to really solve. But I do grasp the immensity of these questions and the need to do it. And the fact that artists can participate in this because artists job is the imaginary and the participatory. So you're going to ask me about, you know, making art in the period of the of, of uh, the virus, I'll be very glad when it's over in that level, because I do feel 
that participation, however much it's uh, stimulated by things that like what you're doing, we're doing right now, talking through Zoom and so on. And I don't want us to give that up, but we we need not, we, we cannot also give up the, the smell, the taste, the touch. Even if we were able to make an internet connection that would allow us, I could reach out and touch, that would allow us to smell and taste. Uh, it still wouldn't be the same, you know, as the actual physical erotic, sensual, sexual smell and touch. So right now we are privileging the eye and the ear and leaving the nose, the mouth, the uh, skin out of these interactions. And oh, that's okay as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. So I look forward to the time when we can reconvene. Hopefully we won't reconvene only in uh, uh, standard, uh, uh, re uh, you know, black box and proscenium theaters. I've long advocated for a more active kind of theatrical environment. Uh, I think Milo does it, lots of people do it, performance art does it, but I would like to see performance art also undertake the staging and restaging of great texts. That's what I've tried to do in my artistic work from Dionysus through to Commune, through to Imagining Owen, through to my uh, work currently to see how non-proscenium, non-picture, uh, uh, stage, non-fixed seat uh, uh, staging can not only give us personal intimate uh, work as in much performance art, let's say the Marina Abramovich direction, but can give us uh, interpretations of classic texts, new interpretations of them, and make new uh, classic texts in this interactive way. So I am, I am, uh, you know, uh, my, my, let, let's put it this way. My belly is always hopeful. My cook self is always help, hopeful. Uh, but the self that admires Bertolt Brecht is always hopeful. You know, Brecht was a survivor. He knew how to handle the House on American Activities Committee. He could live in Hollywood. He wasn't a, 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 a rigid uh, moralist. I don't like Savonarola's. I don't like rigid moralists. I like people that can, can move and accommodate and move forward and do, do better to do a little good than to die a martyr. You know, uh, so I'm I'm not profoundly a Christian. I'm I'm a Brechtian. I, I don't want to hang up on a cross. I want to do something. So, uh, 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 well, anyway, enough of that. So, I I do feel that we can, we can, uh, 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 we have the opportunity, uh, locally as artists, to reconfigure power structures and uh, aesthetic structures. And then to uh, collaborate with our allies in uh, the social world, the political world, uh, to make deep structural changes, especially in the United States. Uh, in other words, if the United States could, in one fell swoop, become Norway, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. As uh, someone who really uh, has an overview of, of, of global theater through your practice, uh, through your teaching, but also through your publishing. I think you have come across every significant, I think, uh, movement artist. As a, so even so you're a professor, but let's say you're Dr. Schechner, what do you prescribe? What would you say? Of course, we have to think locally, act locally, but think globally. But what do you think would work from your experience, but also from your study of the history, also history of theater. What, would, what works? We are in a time of crisis, plays normally are made about. That's what people write about, you know, uh, but now we're in it and we don't know, but it's not a Netflix drama that has an end, season one, two, three, and then all this, nothing changes. What is your prescription? What do you think could really work? Well, you know, th again, there are two possibilities. At the immediate time when we're in quarantine, we have to uh, work the, the way you're working now. Like uh, this is the second time I've made this kind of appearance. Uh, last week I was uh, participating in a festival in uh, uh, Petersburg. And I'd be glad for those of you out there to do this once a week, once every two weeks under different circumstances, you know. So I think that each of us, you know, the potter makes pots and the uh, uh, bread maker makes bread and the performance maker makes performance, but within the given circumstances uh, and the lecture lectures, within the given circumstances of what we have. So the immediate given circumstances is uh, sheltering at home and distance performing. 
okay, at a certain point, we'll be able to make performances in spaces. All right, so if, if indeed we are told we can't put people right next to each other so that the physical arrangement of a theater is not possible, you know, uh, then let's see if we can make performances perhaps outdoors uh, where people are spaced uh, further apart. Uh, let's see if we can, you know, we can accommodate to those temporary situations. But, but ultimately, uh, we, we have to foresee the time when we can assemble again. I mean, if we never can assemble again, then uh, the, uh, uh, the human project is, is, is sunk. The human project, I mean, we have to assemble again, right? Uh, sexual reproduction cannot occur over the internet. So, uh, uh, but more than that, you know, the whole situation uh, demands uh, uh, getting, not getting back to normal though, getting forward to something new. Now you were asking me, what would I prescribe? I am, I'm bad at that in, in a sense. I can tell you the work that I want to do. Uh, what I heard Milo describe yes, yesterday is very good. I think that these uh, Stadt theaters, the city theaters in Germany, the, all of these, uh, and the festivals should rethink how they present themselves. I think that uh, it, it, they're uh, uh, at one level, you know, at the economic level, uh, tickets should be, the, every performance should have, a, 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 every performance, at least half the performances should be free. To, and not necessarily only going to where people are, but let people come to where the venue is. I mean, let's start opening the performances up. When I did a performance in South Africa in 1986, it was one of the, it was the first African-American play uh, ever done in South Africa. And I had the uh, permission or blessing or approval of the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, ANC uh, because it was at the last moment of apartheid. So the, uh, the, uh, it was at the Grahamstown Festival. It was August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And the uh, sponsors said, yes, the, the theater will be open to people of all races. That was really new. And, and, but the tickets were so expensive that I knew that people from the quote colored uh, 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 regions and people from the black townships could never afford to go. I mean, maybe some uh, high level professionals and all, but the ordinary people wouldn't. So what I said to him, this is kind of a Brechtian strategy. I said, well, you know, I do this kind of environmental theater. It's very complex. I can't see how it's going to work in this gymnasium. I need to have a few previews because uh, to see if it's going to work. He said, well, that's a good idea. I said, but, you know, because they're previews, who knows how good they'll be? I mean, I knew they would be very good. Let's open it to the community. Let anybody come for free. And of course, people came and they mixed it was 80% people of color, black or, or what the South Africans then were calling color, Indian, a few whites. And we had three performances of the total of uh, nine performances we gave were, were like that. They were called previews. So there are different strategies to really open up these uh, official theaters, Lincoln Center, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, the, which are now, when I go to the theater in New York, I see mainly you know older people, uh, except if it's a show aimed at African Americans or people of color, mostly white intellectuals. And part of it is, even though the tickets aren't so expensive, they feel expensive. So the, we, we need to have a kind of a, a certain number of performances absolutely for free that would bring people in. I like the idea of going to the community, but I also like the idea of traveling, of having people from different communities, having like, like bringing people so that there's a, a, a mix. I also think that performances should uh, almost auto, always be accompanied by discussions afterwards, not just occasionally, and not uh, little surface uh, discussions where the uh, 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 director or a couple of actors come out and say a few things, but like what we're having now, discussions in which people can really engage with what the artist intended and 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 whether they accomplished it or not you know let's let's uh, let's take the uh, uh, the notion of criticism away from the few critics and the newspapers and put it into the hands of spectators by saying after every performance there there are uh, uh, discussions let's after every performance even the paid ones give out 50 free tickets to the people who are there to give to their friends. 
uh, you know, there are ways of, 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 of expanding, democratizing, uh, changing these things that, that, that are kind of structural, uh, that we don't think of. You don't think of going to the theater and, and leaving with one fifth of the people getting a free ticket, but the free ticket, the, the intention, of course they can come back themselves, but the intention is that they give it to someone so that you, you spread it out that way. Or we don't think of a theater as, as always including perhaps something before, then the e event, and then something afterwards, that it is an intellectual uh, engagement and a social engagement, as well as just receiving the artwork. In other words, we've conceived of theater since the Renaissance as something fixed, like, a, like in the art gallery. You go to see it, it's there, and you leave it. Uh, but it shouldn't be. It should be a social event. The uh, art galleries are art galleries. I'm not so, you know, I, I like them, but I, I'm, I'm not I'm not a great museum art goer because it's it's too concentrated, it's too passive for me. Even though I'm interacting with the with the artwork, you know, uh, I don't want to be too critical of it. I do enjoy it, but I'm seeing that that performance could be much, much, much more interactive, profoundly at its structural level, and that's what I would like to experiment with. Uh, also, all performances should be streamed, so that every performance that you have people in it that uh, thousands of people who are not there should do it. So we have this stuff, we're doing it now, but every performance should be streamed for free, open on you know whatever channel you wanna make it, YouTube or whatever, so that every single performance going on in the world should be out there streamed for free. I don't think that would uh, deprive people from coming to see it. People will wanna come to see the actual thing, but it would vastly expand the audience, not just a few, not the Metropolitan Opera at eight o'clock at night for a hundred dollars in a little theater. Every Metropolitan Opera uh, should be for free on the streaming. So those are things that, you know, I know it's utopian, but I would like to see happen. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, we buy uh, music recordings, but still we crave to see the music playing live and the band. Yes, and the, uh, and all, the hall. all live events. <clears throat> we should now, because we're learning how to do this, we should take as, auto, uh, as axiomatic uh, Schechner's first axiom of post-virus, all live performances streamed. Good. Oh. Good. Yeah, it's time you write also a manifesto, you put it together. Milo yesterday came to it, he said, you know, referring also to your work, he said, I look back because he has time. I think he also actually studied Greek language and, uh, uh, and Latin. I can't and hear that. you, uh, um, Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, there's a um, sign outside. Milo. Yeah, it was one of the New York sirens going by, having yeah. a patient. Yeah, let everybody listen to it. There it is. That's the virus, friends. But, but that sounds like a fire truck, not an ambulance. Or both. Okay, I can hear yeah. you now. Yeah, so Milo said, um, I'm also referring to your work, he is looking at the Greeks also again and uh, I mean, his Antigone project, uh, which he did in Brazil and where he's going to rewrite the ending and all of it, um, where he has actors who are actually the activists, uh, really from, from real life. But he said there were serious events in the city of Athens. They were on a crisis like us, wars ending. And, you, and they reacted in creating that. So, so your view, looking back, what has, what has theater performance played? What was that specific role in that? almost mythical time of, of, of Athens and Greece. What, what did it really do? If you could give us your view, what, what was the function? Of what? I'm not understanding of the, the of the function of the theaters or the play at the time in Athens. You know, in back time in of Athens, crisis. was yeah. the function? Oh. Yeah, in the time of the crisis, because Milo said they created performances. Well, I'm not so sure that the that, uh, end of the fifth century, you know, when, when Sophocles wrote, uh, 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 you know, he wrote those plays in different, in a different order. Uh, I think Philoctetes uh, was his last play. At any rate, when he wrote Oedipus, I'm not sure that Athens was, quote, in crisis. Uh, Athens, uh, you know, uh, the, because after the fifth century came Aristotle, you know, the plays were still performed for a, a couple of centuries afterwards. So I don't know what crisis Milo was talking about. There were the uh, continual wars between Athens and Sparta, but Sparta was basically uh, victorious. I don't think we should romanticize or Europeanize or racialize Athens. So let's, let's look at it in its own historical context. First of all, most of the people in Athens 
were disenfranchised. They were slaves or women. So although women are really important characters in the dramas, they don't perform in the dramas. I'm not sure that they actually attended the performances. They certainly were not political players directly. So that is an interesting question, the answer to which I don't know. Why are women so important in the dramas when they were not so important in the society? What was going on that we don't know? I think that opens a great question or maybe some uh, classic scholars out there who know a great deal more about that period than I do would tell me about the function of women. But there, there are, as best I know, there are no real Antigones or Medeas or Clytemnestras uh, you know, or Phaedras in Athenian society at that time. And also there were many slaves. Then there's a great book, I've forgotten his, his author, but it's called Black Athena. And part of the thesis of Black Athena is that Athenian society was not, was uh, largely influenced by uh, Egypt. And Egypt was Nilotic, not Arabic at that time. If you look at the statuary of the pharaohs, uh, you know, what we have, the painted, uh, uh, scarcophagi and things, they're brown-skinned people, and maybe they were even darker, and they have uh, full lips and full noses. They don't look uh, Middle Eastern. They look more from the bottom part of, uh, of Africa coming up. And remember that uh, uh, Luxor used to be the capital of Egypt, way down the Nile River, and then they moved north to where the pyramids are. And my theory about the pyramids are that in Luxor, in the Valley of the Kings, all the pharaohs were buried inside the mountains. Then for political reasons, uh, Egypt moved its center north to uh, around where Cairo is today. And, but the people were still Nilotic. They were not modern Middle Eastern people. And they didn't have mountains to build the kings. So they built pyramids, which are perfected to, uh, artificial mountains. So the kings could still be buried in the mountains as they mm -hmm. were buried in the mountain down in Luxor. And that there was a, the Black Athena says that this civilization uh, uh, came around to some degree up over through Turkey and around and down through Macedonia into Athens and up through the Mediterranean, that Athens was a much more Africanized uh, society than we want to have it now, that the Athens in our imagination created by Renaissance European scholars is painted white and is made European and made, we we're thinking of it as the beginning of, of Europe, but maybe Athens was a much a, a more a colorful in the mm -hmm. cultural sense, as well as the so-called racial sense than, than we conceive it now. And uh, that these, uh, these uh, we, there's a lot we don't know, you know? We do know that also uh, uh, Athens was reconceived by the Romans, by the Latins. And their origin myth, I happen to be at the present moment, one of the things I'm doing during the, uh, uh, this time of, of, of pause and reading, I, I read the uh, entire New Testament. I had never done that. And I'm halfway through the Old Testament, but I'm also reading the Aeneid of Virgil. And so the, the Roman story of their origins is a very interesting story. It's Aeneas flees Troy, which is in Asia Minor in current Turkey, certainly not uh, Greece, and comes and spends time with Dido in Carthage in Africa, right? The place mm -hmm. where later Hannibal would come. Hannibal and comes from, from Carthage, he moves north to Latina, as it's called it. He moves to Rome and founds, and founds Rome, Aeneas founds Rome. That's the story that Virgil tells, the, the imaginary that they wanted to have. So their imaginary is Asia Minor, Africa, Rome, not Greece, Rome. Rome swallowed Greece, and we get it from the Roman perspective. Greece did not form Rome. We, that's the myth that we want to have uh, uh, that is created by Renaissance. So there's a lot that we really don't know. And I think that history by people who are much mm -hmm. smarter and more versed in the language uh, need to rethink. But I don't think that uh, the Greece of the tra tragic of the fifth century uh, the century of Plato, not Aristotle, the century of Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides. And remember, Sophocles outlived Euripides by one year. So they were really contemporaries. We think of them, Euripides coming later, but no, he didn't come later. He was, he was younger, but Sophocles lived to be 96 years old and he wrote plays until he was in his 90s. Philoctetes is in his 90s. Uh, Oedipus and Colonus is very late 
also, or maybe it's Oedipus and Colonus that's the last play, one of those two plays. At any rate, they're contemporaries. Maybe they weren't white guys in the cultural sense. Maybe they were or something else. Maybe in the society that they envisioned, women were very important in, in the imaginary, even though they weren't very important uh, uh, socially or politically in the actual society. So there's a lot to know there. And I, I, uh, I, I would like Milo to tell me what the crisis was yeah. in fifth century Greece. I don't know of any. Well, it's certainly that um, theater was c closely connected to the life of the city in a kind of a spiritual um, sense. But uh, yes, also the Greek uh, statues, as we know from that great Senckenberg Museum exhibition, statues were all painted and they were all, yeah, they white, were all washed. Yeah, they were all dark black faces and they was taken out, sanded away. They found little pigments and some statues that were then came out, I think also Pompeii, where they saw they all right. painted. People saw they looked so ugly. Uh, they can't be the real things, but that's Correct. what they were. But coming to your work, you are also working um, on, uh, as a theater artist at the moment on your, on your play. So um, how does your day look like when you get up? How do you do that? What, what are your research? Well, right now, what, what do you do on the, for your artistic work? Well, right now I'm working on a book about Ram Lila of Ramnagar, which is an India, 31 day Indian cycle play on the life of Ram who is the, uh, one of the avatars of Vishnu, the seventh avatar of the seventh incarnation of Vishnu. So I'm collaborating with a group, uh, uh, Rishika Behrishi, who is a, a young uh, Indian scholar on this particular book. And I'm also working with Melissa Flower and a group of Indian younger uh, scholars and artists. And we're putting together this book, which comes out of the 8,500 photographs I took and some of them my son Sam took in India of this performance, which I've been attending from 1976. The last time I went was 2014. And I'll go back one more time. So I'm working on this book on a daily basis. Prior to that, when we could uh, get together and meet, I was working on a project called Dark Yes. And that uh, uh, is, uh, I put that aside because I'm not going to work virtually on it. Uh, but it is a, uh, it has four basic, uh, 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 text, performance text. One, of course, as always, is the life of the performers I'm working with. There was a, a group, some of whom I worked on with Imagining O, which was an earlier performance we can talk about. You saw it, I, you know, Imagining O. So some of those people are working with me and s some new people. And Dark Yes has their lives and their des desires. It's about desire in politics. So the texts are, are the dark is from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. And uh, so that text, and if you know that text is a story within a story. So that text is Marlowe is uh, on the boat uh, in the Thames as the tide is going to change and they're waiting for the tide to change. And he tells the story of the time that he went up the Congo River to the interior of what was at that point, the Belgian Congo, probably the cruelest of the European uh, colonies and a lot of them were very cruel. Uh, it's mm -hmm. hard to compare them for cruelty, but certainly the Belgian Congo, the personal property of the King, King Leopold of Belgium was uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, cruel in its quest for ivory and gold tusks, uh, m more ivory than gold, but there was gold in the interior of the Congo as well. So that, that text and uh, then uh, I'm also using the uh, Molly Bloom soliloquy at the end of James Joyce's Ulysses. And uh, that's where uh, uh, the, the whole novel Ulysses is a kind of take on the, on the odyssey of Homer, but it's Leopold Bloom instead of Ulysses and it's mm -hmm. different bars in Dublin and places in Dublin that he goes to rather than the uh, spots around the Mediterranean that uh, Odysseus did. And Penelope is his wife, Molly, waiting at home. And the end of the book is a chapter, is a, is a long monologue, her speaking. Of course, it's a man writing a woman's voice. And, uh, but it's a very, very powerful, you know, Joyce is a very powerful writer. So we're using some of that. And the, the final, final sentence of that is, yes, yes, I said I would. Uh, he, I brought him down, the, he could smell the fragrance in my breast. Yes, yes, I will meaning I will marry him, uh, but, uh, but uh, so that's where the yes comes from. 
And then a third text, which I discovered as we're working, is Roger Casement. Now, Roger Casement is not as well known as Conrad or Joyce. Uh, and, uh, but Casement, like Joyce, was Irish. And Casement was a very, very vehement Irish nationalist. Uh, he was also uh, gay. So he also went to the Congo and he wrote to uh, Conrad in Casement had a correspondence about the Congo. A lot of, or some of what uh, uh, Conrad knows about the Congo comes from Casement. Now Casement was hung by the British at the, uh, uh, in World War I because he wanted the Germans to deliver arms to the Irish so that the Irish could uh, be successful in their rebellion against the English. His reputation has now been uh, largely recuperated, but he was hung as a, tried and hung as a traitor. But part of the trial is uh, about him being homosexual and homophobia, mm -hmm. uh, because he, Caseman kept two diaries, the black diary and the yeah. white diary. In one of the diaries, he wrote his anthropological studies and his reports and so on. In the other, he wrote about his personal life, which was a lot of sexual encounters with very young uh, uh, males, boys in the Amazon, really, yeah. Amazonia, That's which is- is, your, is Corona changing that? Is the well, Corona uh, well, let me changing? just say this, yeah. that the Amazon is to casement what the Congo is to uh, uh, Conrad. So the Thank Amazon you. is also up river of a great river, the Amazon River and not the Congo River. So I'm putting all those together. Now, what did you ask about the- uh, is, it, is your work, do you feel there's a change or in that work, or well, you no, try I, just I, go I deeper into the Corona time? Does that influence now what you do or you feel it well, is- Well, uh, it doesn't influence dark yes yet because I stopped working on it before the virus. So mm -hmm. it wasn't the virus that stopped me. I worked on it for a year last year and then in the spring, I decided to do this book about India. So mm -hmm. uh, definitely the uh, experience, whatever will happen on the other side of the virus, when I return to that artistic work, it will inf inflect it. It has to inflect it. You know, uh, an artist makes work out of both what is, you know, Brecht again said, you want to build a house, use the bricks that are there. So the bricks that are there are available text, of course, we know that but also the performers, but also the creator's own experiences. So we've all gone through this. It's a kind of a, an initiation. We don't know what the outcome will be. So of course it will affect what I'm doing. The real question would be, is it affecting how I'm working on the Ram Lila? In a mm -hmm. way, yes, and in a way not, because that's a traditional performance. I wanna know if it's, I, I would be very surprised if it's not going to be done next uh, fall it attracts hundreds of thousands of people. So the question mm. is, where will India be in the yeah. world of the virus at the time when these great festivals occur? There are a number of them. The Ramlila is not the only one, but the Ramlila is one of the largest. So yeah. what will they do? I don't know. I don't think yeah, they yeah. know yet, but I'd be very surprised if they cancel it. Yeah, I mean, you talked about it at the Seagull where we had the Shekna Day and for weeks, three weeks, the ongoing festivals. In Germany, most probably, it looks like even till the summer next year, they will not have any major big uh, well, they sports events, Oberammergau. gatherings. They stopped Oberammergau, Oberammergau yeah. which is interesting because Oberammergau was made to commemorate and celebrate survival of the plague. So yeah. if there's one thing they shouldn't have stopped yeah. is Oberammergau. They should have had it and mm -hmm. videoed it or have people scattered around because it is, it is a performance uh, traced to the earlier play, you know. Yeah. I will write said, the director, Christo, we know him, we had him, that's a, a good suggestion. So um, yeah, I think mo in Egypt, mosques are closed uh, for the first time in a thousand years. So it is a serious, serious uh, uh, thing that is happening right now. Um, we are coming also closer you know, to the end. And maybe we should just have longer talks. I hate to break it up now because as you suggested, maybe we should have. Well, this has been in. a great pleasure. So Thank I'm you. not inviting but, myself back, but if you invite me, I'll come yes. back. You, you will, of course. So what, for, for, and you have been such a great ed educator also. You have generations of artists and also um, theater um, um, academics, thinkers who went through the Shekno School. 
so w- what do you see? What do, what, 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 what do you say? What would you say to these young faces in front of you? I, I would say uh, to the them, uncertainty that's out there. And as you said, the fear, you know, that is there. Well, I would say to them, them, human history is full of crises. You know, uh, if you think uh, in the days of 1939, 40, 41, 42, when uh, Hitler was about to rule the world, uh, when the terrible blitz of London and so on, those were very dark and uh, hard days. The Great Depression from 1931 through the 30s were hard days. The, 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 the Spanish flu, as you say, the bubonic plague, the Black Plague. In other words, human history is, is full of, of times and of bad times and good times. Maybe we have gotten used to uh, a, a, a fairly long stretch of where bad times are a little bit like this and not a whack on the face. So now we got a whack on the face. It's not the first one. And as I said, because of climate change, it's not gonna be the last one. Hopefully we learn from them. So I would say to the younger people, you must do your work and you must keep hope. But what is hope? Hope is not an idea. Hope is an action. You know you are hopeful when you do something. You know you're in despair when you say, I can't do anything, Uh, but you can, and you must, and you will. Thank you, Richard. That's, um, I think, is a a good good way uh, to end. And really, thank you for for taking your time. It's a lot to think about, uh, um, and what you said, and we should be back. And, uh, you know, that is um, an important uh, contribution that also theater artists and uh, people in the theater are very most significant commentators also, as you said, on the three spheres of where we are and where we are going to, but also um, where we do come from. Um, tomorrow we have Basil Jones from the Great Handspring Theater Company mm-hmm. of South Africa, fantastic theater artist. He's gonna share also a bit what he's creating in his home, his, uh, his puppet's work, but also he, he uh, has seen as Richard um, changes in his country and was part of, of the change. We have. Uh, Arthur Noziciel and Karen Ann from uh, Rennes in France, who are creating at their theater as a Centre Dramatique, I think, uh, a response, one of the few theaters actually in France. The Avignon Festival has been canceled, and uh, the greatest theater festival, the uh, most significant one, which may, maybe always went on doing the business as usual. It's also, as Richard said, a slap in the face. Who knows what will happen, but also that will reforce, uh, hopefully, a, a restart and a rethinking of what we do. Great festivals actually have been created after World War II. I think the Avignon Festival and also the Edinburgh Festival, if I'm right, came out after the closure, the end of social life, as right. we knew it. And we know society works when theater works, when theater yes. is great and performances are out. That's we know when it works. And then we have um, the great Guillermo Calderon from Chile. Um, who also lives in a country with a history that has gone through change that we hear from him. But Richard, say, say. Well, I want to thank you for doing this series. This is a very important series, and it's a marvelous piece of work you're doing. Thank and you. I know it's a ton of work to organize it. Yeah. So my kiss to you and thank, you, thank Richard. you very much. Yeah, because it comes from you, and I know you mean it, that it's really uh, means the world to me. Thank you, and thank you, our listeners. And again, thanks to HowlRound for taking on to host us every day. Um, And uh, I hope you will tune in again and also re-listen maybe to some of the messages we heard from Burkina Faso, from Burkina Faso, from Hong Kong, and uh, from Italy, uh, Meredith Monk, and so many men, Thomas Ostermeyer in Berlin, and uh, and many, many others. So thank you for uh, joining in, and hope to... Yes.